Let's turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and we begin tonight with verse 13. We read, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about threescore furlongs. That same day, back to verse 1, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning. So we are dealing with the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And as we mentioned, Luke, first of all, tells us the events that took place in the morning of that day. And last week we tried to sort of put the gospel accounts together to give you a composite of the happenings of the morning of the resurrection. Now Luke brings to us an incident that took place in the afternoon and, and early evening of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And of course he will then tell us events that took place on the evening and at night that first day that Jesus rose from the dead. He is going to address now two of them. They being disciples of Jesus Christ who had been following him. But they were two who had not been chosen as apostles and so we don't really have much information about them except that one of them is named for us, uh, Cleopas is named, and we do read in uh, one of the other Gospels, the Gospel of John, that one of the Marys that was standing near the cross when Jesus was crucified was the wife of Cleopas. And so uh, it is very possible that that is the same Cleopas that we have in this story. There were many disciples who had come from Galilee with Jesus to Jerusalem for this feast of the Passover. There were at least a hundred and twenty of them. So that when we get into the book of Acts and we find the disciples waiting in Jerusalem for the promise of the Spirit, we are told that they were continuing steadfast in prayer, waiting upon God, and the number of them being about a hundred and twenty. And so the disciples of Christ weren't limited to just the 12 that we are familiar with. They were called to be apostles and that, in, in that they had a little special uh, relationship uh, that their names are given to us and they do rise a little above the others in relationship. But there were many, many disciples. And so two of them would be two of the disciples, of the many disciples of Jesus that had come to Jerusalem with him. And they were going to this little village of Emmaus, which is, um, we are told here, 60 furlongs. A furlong is 582 feet, and so it's approximately seven miles west of Jerusalem, the little village of Emmaus. And as they are going along the road to Emmaus, they were talking together about all of the things that had happened. Verse 14. In their minds, Jesus was dead. They had no real hope of a resurrection at this point. But they were talking about all of the things that had happened, which probably included the ministry of Jesus. Reminiscing about 
the many things that they had seen, the miracles that Jesus had performed. They were talking about the cross and how it had dashed their hopes. And perhaps they were really speculating, what do we do now? You know, suddenly your whole life is dashed. Your hopes are gone and, and you find yourself back to zero and you know, just where do we go? Where do we pick up the pieces? And what pieces do we pick up? And how do we put our lives back together? We had really given ourselves over to the hope that this man was the Messiah. And having given themselves over to this hope, now that he is crucified, they really are at a loss as to what to do, where to go, what happens now? They had come to Jesus Christ. They had found that peace, that hope. But now their lives are filled with mystery and hopelessness. And while they were thus communing together and reasoning. Jesus himself drew near and began to walk along with them. But we are told their eyes were holden that they should not know him. So here they are walking along the road to Emmaus, talking about the things that had happened. Sad dejected, filled with despair. And suddenly Jesus just sort of picks up the gate and is striding along with them. But their eyes are holden that they don't know that it's Jesus. Someone has suggested that it was because they were walking into the sunset that their eyes were sort of blinded by the sun. It was late afternoon, and they were on their way to Emmaus. The sun would be going down uh, to the west there, and uh, perhaps the sun being in their eyes. I, I have difficulty with that, but it's a suggestion by one of the commentators. And he uses it as a beautiful analogy. He said, you see, the Christian should never be walking towards the sunset. The Christian is al always walking towards the sunrise. We look forward to the new day, the glorious day of the Lord, and we're always walking towards the sun. It makes a beautiful analogy, but I don't think that it really has uh, much factual basis to it. Their eyes were held back from recognizing Jesus. Surely, one of the reasons their eyes were holden was because of their unbelief. Unbelief can be a very blinding thing. And of course, there is a phrase that there are none so blind as those who will not see. Those who have a, a determined unbelief. I don't want to believe. I won't believe and uh, none so blind. Now these men were blinded by their unbelief. Had they been expecting Jesus to rise as he said he would on the third day, then they should have been anticipating seeing him. They should be watching for him. And when this stranger was catching up with them from behind, they should have, the first thought should have been, I wonder if that's Jesus. 
You see, had they been filled with belief in the resurrection, had they believed the words of the Lord, they would have been expecting and anticipating seeing Jesus, and surely they would have recognized him. What a horrible thing unbelief is, because it'll hold you back from seeing the very truth that is standing beside you. How many people today are blinded to the fact of the resurrection of Jesus because of their unbelief? Another thing is ignorance. It is a very blinding thing. And they were ignorant of the scriptures. Where Jesus had prophesied these things and the Old Testament scriptures they were ignorant of those, and that's the very issue that Jesus took up when he started to talk with them and talk to them concerning this blindness. He said, oh, slow of heart to believe all that the Scriptures have said. And so it was their ignorance of the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures that dealt with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that had blinded their eyes. Now Jesus said unto them, What in the world are you talking about as you're walking along here that has made you so sad? What's wrong with you guys? What are you talking about that causes you to be so sad? Now, Jesus, of course, knew exactly what they were talking about. And, and I personally see a little humor in this. Uh, Jesus, knowing full well what their problem is, is drawing them out to express their problem. And so one of the two, the Cleopas that we know by name, said, are you only a stranger in Jerusalem and you do not know the things which have happened there in these last few days? Literally, he was saying to Jesus, you must be the only one in all of Jerusalem that didn't know what went on in the last few days there. Are you the only one? that doesn't know what's been happening the last few days. And Jesus again responds, what things? Jesus was wanting them to give their interpretation of the events that had taken place in Jerusalem. And they answered, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And then they began to express certain beliefs that they had concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And they said, which was a prophet, This man was a prophet of God in their estimation who was mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. This was a mighty prophet. Great deeds. In remembering Jesus, they remembered first of all his deeds. They remembered how the blind were made to see, how the lame were made to walk, how the deaf were made to hear, how the dead were brought back to life, how the multitudes were fed with just a few loaves of bread and a few fish. He was mighty in deeds. He did tremendous miracles, deeds, while he was here on this earth. 
When Peter began to preach to the people on the day of Pentecost, he introduced Jesus of Nazareth, and he said, a man who was proved to be of God by the signs and the miracles that he did. So even as these two men say Jesus of Nazareth, and first of all, they are relating the things that Jesus did, the mighty deeds. A prophet of God, mighty indeed. Peter said Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was proved to be of God by the signs and the wonders and the miracles that he accomplished. The works of Jesus, the miracles that he wrought are one of the witnesses to the fact that he is the Son of God. When John the Baptist sent his disciples to Jesus, John being in prison, and they had the question from John, are you the one, are you the Messiah, or shall we start looking for another? John was impatient there in Herod's jail. Let's get the program going. Get me out of here. And Jesus in the same hour healed many of the sick that were brought to him. The blind were able to see, the lame were walking, and he just said to the disciples, go back and tell John what you have seen. The miracles, the healings that he wrought were a testimony to the fact that he was the Messiah, he was the Son of God. When Philip, the night that Jesus was betrayed and was talking with his disciples for one of the last times, and Philip said, Lord, just show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said, have I been so long a time with you and have you not seen me, Philip? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Believest thou that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe for the very work's sake. And so Jesus called upon his works as a proof that he was of the Father, that the Father was in him and that he was in the Father, that he and the Father were one. I am doing the works of the Father. And again, in an earlier chapter in John, Jesus calls to his works as a witness as to his being, the Son of God. So, as they are thinking about Jesus, the first thing they think about is that he was a mighty prophet and he did the deeds of a prophet. But not only a prophet in mighty deeds, but also in his words. When Jesus gave the Christian manifesto, the Sermon on the Mount, there at the beginning of his public ministry. When he finished the Sermon on the Mount, we are told in Matthew's Gospel that the people were really all amazed. They said, for he doesn't teach like the scribes but he teaches as one who has authority. Now, when the scribes would teach the scriptures, they would say, now, Rabbi Hillel says this, and Rabbi uh, Gamaliel says this, and, and they would never just assert a truth, but they would give the interpretations of the various learned and respected rabbis. 
They'd never say, now I tell you the truth. No, no. no. Rabbi Hallel said that this is the truth. And, and they would always teach with that kind of quoting of some learned rabbi rather than speaking themselves. But notice what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Ye have heard that it hath been said by those of old time. But I say unto you, You've heard that this was said, but I say unto you. And this kind of teaching startled them. They hadn't heard this kind of teaching before, where a man will just straightly say, but I say unto you, and will speak with authority. And so they marveled at his teaching, because it wasn't as the scribes, for he spoke as one who had authority. And well, might he speak as one who has an authority, because he did have authority and when he said I say and of course over and over in John's gospel we read verily verily I say unto you speaking with great authority when soldiers were sent out to arrest Jesus and they came back empty-handed they said well where is he why didn't you arrest him and they said never has a man spoken as this man, mighty in words. The words of Jesus bring comfort and hope to mankind. Today, almost 2,000 years later, the words of Jesus bring us hope they bring us encouragement they bring us cheer they bring us comfort and it is the words of Jesus that we turn to in our hour of need in our hour of sorrow when death strikes we turn to the words of Jesus, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house there are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know, for I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. And in those words of Jesus, our hearts are strengthened, our spirits are cheered, and it turn, turns really our despair into hope. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And we find hope, we find strength, we find comfort in the words of Jesus. A man who was mighty in deeds and in word. The next thing they said about Jesus is that the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death. Now here was a man, a prophet, who was mighty in deed and in word, but our chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death. The chief priests and rulers could not bring forth the sentence of death upon a prisoner. That right had been taken away from them by the Roman government. They did not have the right of capital punishment. Interestingly enough, it was about the time that Jesus was a small boy in Nazareth that this power was taken by the Roman government from the Jews. And upon the Roman government taking away their power of capital punishment, they interpreted that as the end of their rule. And many of them put 
ashes upon their heads and they put sackcloth upon their bodies and they prayed through the streets of Jerusalem mourning because God's word had failed according to their understanding. For when Jacob made the prophecies over his sons in the book of Genesis to Judah, he said, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until the Messiah comes, until Shiloh comes. And when the Roman government took away their power of capital punishment, they interpreted that as the scepter having departed from Judah and thus their mourning in sackcloth and ashes according to Josephus prating through Jerusalem. Little did they know that the Messiah was even then in Nazareth being prepared by the Spirit to be revealed to the nation. But he was rejected by the rulers. They had condemned him to death. When he, the chief priest asked Jesus, Are you the Messiah? And Jesus responded, You said it. And he asked him then the second question, Are you then the Son of God? And Jesus again responded, you said it. He then tore his robe and he said, what need we of further witnesses? You've heard him with his own mouth. What do you say? And they all responded, he is worthy of death. So he was condemned to death by the leaders, by the chief priests, but they could not carry out the execution. For that they had to turn to the Roman government. And that is why they delivered Jesus into the hands then of the Gentiles. They had condemned him to death, but they delivered him into the hands of the Gentiles unto the court of Pilate in order that they might get a sentence of death passed upon him. However, the charges that they brought before the Roman court were far different than the charges for which they condemned him to death. They condemned him to death because he confessed to being the Messiah and confessed to being the Son of God. And they interpreted that as blasphemy and condemned him to death for that. But coming to the Roman government, that kind of charge would have been thrown out of the Roman court. And so they brought other charges against him before the Roman government, and that is that he is a seditious person. He is opposed to Caesar. He has been encouraging people not to pay taxes to Caesar. He stirs up people against the government. And of course, Jesus was examined thoroughly by Pilate on these issues and was found by Pilate not guilty. But as the disciples are talking to Jesus about Jesus, they say our chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death. Now the interesting thing is they are telling Jesus that what happened were the very things Things that Jesus had prophesied to them that would happen to him. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 33, listen to what Jesus said to his disciples Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. Now they're telling Jesus, you know, here was 
This man, he was a prophet. He was mighty in his deeds and his words. But the chief priests and the rulers condemned him to death. That's exactly what Jesus told them was going to happen. And so they are only affirming to Jesus that the things that he had predicted did indeed come to pass. Jesus went on to say, And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. So the disciples are telling Jesus how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Yes, he told them that that would happen. But he also told them, Mark 10, 34, and the third day he shall rise again. Now you see, had they been paying attention to what Jesus had said, this should have been the day that they were all anticipating somehow, some way, his resurrection. He had predicted it. He had prophesied it. And as they are talking about the things that transpired, they are saying that the things happened even as Jesus had said they would happen. However, here is the third day, and instead of looking for him, they're walking along sad, dejected, in despair. In fact, they went on to say, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Notice that's in the past tense. We trusted, or we had trusted. It's past tense. We had hoped in him the redemption of Israel. It was our hope that he was the Messiah. He was the one. We had hoped. But those hopes, that trust, was dashed when they crucified the Lord. Because they did not know the scriptures, because they did not listen to the words of Jesus, they were sad and dejected. It was a hope that once burned in their hearts. As they walked with Jesus, they said, when the Messiah comes, will he do a greater works than these? This got to be the Messiah. He talked to them of things of the kingdom, and they got all excited. Lord, when are you going to set it up, you know? They had hoped in him for the redemption of Israel, the kingdom to be established. And now the hope is dashed. He's dead. Terrible thing when a person loses hope. There is something very strong and powerful about hope. We have made mention before of experiments that were done on wharf rats in putting them in these big containers of water. And spraying them while they're in there. And they drowned in an average of 17 minutes. They survived for 17 minutes before drowning. And in the controlled experiment they took then these other wharf rats. And just about the time that they were going to drown, just about 16 minutes, they pulled them out of the water, dried them off, fed them, let them run around the cages again for a few days. And then they put them back in the same condition. 
and these rats that have been saved from drowning once now survive for an average of 36 hours because they had a hope that someone's going to pull me out of this thing, you know. <laughs> and with that hope, it sustained them from the average of 17 minutes to an average of 36 hours. And the, the psychologists that were conducting the experiment said it was because they had been saved that they had such hope. <laughs> These disciples had hoped but the death brought an end to the hope. And then they went on to say and beside all of this Today is the third day since these things were done. In other words, I do believe that as they were standing by the cross that they were hoping that Jesus would come down off the cross. I think that as they stood there, they were, they were, they were really just waiting for this dramatic miracle to take place. And, and I think they were saying, okay, now, Lord, now's the time. Go ahead, Lord. Just come down and show them who you really are. And I think that this, this time waiting was a time when there was still hope. They say as long as there's life, there's hope. But when he cried, it is finished, and said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And his body went limp as his head came down upon his chest. I think that there was despair. I think some of them maybe thought, well, maybe... As soon as we take him down, he brought the dead back to life before. And maybe, you know, when we take him down off the cross, but now it's three days. It's his third day since it happened. All of these things took place. And in their minds, because it was the third day, it's too late. Nothing can happen now. He missed his opportunity to show himself. Too late for any miracle, it's over. It's the end of a beautiful dream. God had a chance to work, but he didn't. You know, God so many times has gone over my deadlines. I've given him so much time to work. I've got the whole thing figured out, you know, that, uh, yeah, it's not too late yet, you know. <laughs> I could still save this thing. It's going to be a little tougher now, but, you know, but then there is that deadline where you say, well, well, he had a chance. I mean, he could have, and you know, he blew it, but too bad. The amazing thing that I have discovered, though, is that so many times when God has gone over my deadline, when I have given up hope, when I have despaired then, I said, well, you know, it's not going to be. But somehow he pulled it off, even after he had gone beyond my deadline. He, can, he did work. He, he, he did accomplish. I thought it was too late. And yet when he finally did work, I realized how perfect his timing was. Oh, that we would learn to trust the Lord. 
even to trust the Lord's timing. That we would forsake this business of giving deadlines to God. Now, Lord, if you don't do something by Saturday, I'm going to have to, you know, take it in my own hands and I'm going to have to do this, Lord. So you've got till Saturday to work this thing out and then I'm going to take over. Oh, no, you've never done that, but I do. <laughs> and here with the disciples, and it's the third day, you know. He could have, he had his chance, but now it's the third day. The interesting thing is that this is the day. The third day, he said, I'll rise again. And it is the day in which there should have been the anticipation and the hope should have been bright on this day had they only been listening to Jesus. It should have been the day of, of tremendous excitement. and This is the third day, all right, you know. But instead, this is the third day. <laughs> How many times? Are we sad, disconsolate? Because we feel that the plan of God has gone sour. We look at the circumstances and we think, oh my. But we need to remember the lesson that God taught Nebuchadnezzar that it is God who rules in the affairs of man. We need to remember that God is still on the throne. Man may rebel against the authority of God. Man might rise up in blasphemy against God. But our God reigns. And he is in control. And we need to remember that especially in these days. As the scripture declares, evil days shall wax worse and worse. And Jesus, in speaking of the time when he would return, said, and when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? on the earth. It's going to be a time of tremendous testing. Evil days waxing worse and worse. And as we see the fulfillment of that prophecy, as we see the blasphemy of man against our precious Lord, we need to remember God reigns. He's in control. God has put the limits on what Satan can do. He can only go so far and God has described the boundaries for him. And God will yet bring his good purposes to pass upon this earth. And for us, as we see these things coming to pass upon the earth, rather than being sad and dejected and walking along, kicking the rocks on the path, oh, woe is us. Jesus said you ought to be looking up and lifting up your head because your redemption is drawing nigh. It's almost over. The things that Jesus said would be taking place are taking place. His words are still true. He was mighty in word, a prophet mighty in word, and the word is still coming to pass, the word of Jesus and according to his word. 
It isn't the sunset. It is the sunrise that we are looking for, the new day, the day of the Lord. So don't be like the disciples on the road to Emmaus walking off into the sunset. Let's turn around and let's walk into the sunrise, the glorious light of Jesus Christ. We'll continue this study of the afternoon of the resurrection in our lesson next Thursday.